Yes, thank you very much. Well, this is the beginning of the talk because, as you all know, Comic Sans makes hard things funny. Um, <laughs> and since nuclear weapons is a pretty tough topic, I thought we should start off on a lighter note, I guess. Um, but the first thing that I want you all to notice is if we move from jokes about nuclear weapons to real things, it doesn't get any less bizarre. Now, if you consider this photo, <laughs> this is, <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> this is a general of the United States military who, at the conclusion of the first testing series of nuclear weapons after the attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1946, celebrates the great outcome of the operation by slicing into this wonderful mushroom cloud cake together with his wife and some other military guy. Um, so there you have it. It doesn't get any less bizarre. Just one. Uh, serious disclaimer before we start. Now, I'm going to be talking a lot about different countries because nuclear weapons is a problem that really applies worldwide. Um, and what I've learned, I went to the University of Hamburg, I learned uh, peace studies, I'm a physicist, is of course shaped by where I live and um, what I've heard. And also I use sources accessible to me, especially language-wise, that means uh, mostly in English and German, I can't really read Russian sources, I can't use Chinese sources or anything. So what I want to say is, when I talk about the motivations and the history of different countries, I'm going to be talking about countries with uh, a very detailed history and very intricate history like Pakistan, India and Israel, I will, of course, not be able to accurately and completely represent the history and the motivations and the context of all the actions of these countries in such a short time. So if you find that my perspective is biased, that I'm speaking, you know, from the Western uh, point of view or anything, um, then I'm sorry, because I don't really want to do that, and I will be happy to, you know, uh, talk about that afterwards. Okay, so let's uh, get into things. Now, I'm going to spoiler myself um, with the topic of the talk, what did happen to nuclear weapons? I mean, the Cold War is over, right? That was when all the nuclear weapons were like a big problem. Uh, but that, with the end of the 80s, that went away. Well, no, 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 no. The nuclear weapons are still there, and that is the problem. That is the problem, because it didn't diminish, you know. Uh, they didn't just magically disappear, and they didn't get any less deadly, just because that part, which we call the Cold War of the 20th century, um, sort of passed. So, the main questions. Um, one particular fact, which is by itself kind of funny, is that in the world, by international treaties, five countries are allowed legally to have nuclear weapons. Now, that number uh, has gone up to 13 during the course of the 20th century, um, and has by today gone down by nine. Okay, so how did that happen? You know, why five? Why isn't it five? What's going on there? That's one thing we're going to be talking about. Um, we're going to be talking about <laughs> a lot of abbreviations and uh, complicated topics. Um, and I hope that by the end of the talk, at least uh, each one of those abbreviations you should have seen uh, and know what it, it's about. And, of course, what can you do? So that means um, if you're interested in helping solve the problem of nuclear weapons uh, or want to know more about what's going on in all this context, then I'll be providing you with a few tips uh, towards the end of the talk. Okay. Now, nuclear weapons are made of some stuff, and there are some special materials that uh, have to be used in order for a nuclear weapon to work. One of these is uranium, which uh, is a heavy metal um, element that is naturally found in the earth, in minerals. Um, but in order for it to be useful for um, constructing nuclear weapons, you need to make a process called enrichment um, work with it. Uh, and that means that the, uh, the ratio of the isotopes, so, the, so let's say the different parts of different types of uranium that you find when you take it out of the earth, uh, you have to change that. And you have to change it dramatically, like you see in the natural uh, uranium. I just see that I think I got the numbers wrong on the left one, didn't I? Oh, well, okay. The enrichment means that of one particular isotope, um, you need to make the ratio much bigger. Yeah, on the left, that should say, uh, that should be reversed. Um, no? No, no, it shouldn't. Okay, I'll, I'll just move to the next slide, I guess. Um, <laughs> what I want to say is this enrichment process is extremely complicated and extremely expensive. So if you're thinking of getting nuclear weapons, well, this is one way of doing it, but it's going to be a lot of work and it's going to cost a lot. Um, the alternative that you have is plutonium, which is another element, but it's not found naturally in nature because it decays relatively quickly. 
When I say quickly, I mean tens of thousands of years, as opposed to the millions of years for uranium. Um, now, this little bulk of plutonium, which weighs something between 10 and 15 kilograms, is actually a critical mass. Um, so it could explode uh, in a nuclear uh, runaway fission reaction if it had a different shape, which is why they were able to take a picture of it. Um, if this was a ball, if it was a ball, it would be a critical mass and it would explode, but in the shape of a ring, uh, it's not dangerous. So this uh, small... Well, it is dangerous, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> And this you get out of nuclear reactors, the ones you use for electricity generation. Um, you just run your nuclear reactor and you power your light bulbs and computers and blinking lights. Um, and what naturally sort of comes out uh, from this process is plutonium. Now you can speed that up, you can put in some extra uranium to get out some extra plutonium, but basically you just need a, a normal um, nuclear reactor. And that, in comparison to the uranium enrichment, is something which is relatively easy to do, as we're going to be seeing. Okay, so these are the two materials, and then you put them together into a nuclear weapon. By the way, these pictures, they're all from Wikipedia. I mean, there used to be jokes about how, ooh, you know how to build a bomb, and now they're coming after you. Well, everything I'm going to show has been out there for years, so that, I'm not a target. I'm not a target. Um, <laughs> so, the most basic design is called the gun type, which is where you have two subcritical masses, so that means bulks of the nuclear material that are too little to explode by themselves, and you put them together. Normally, uh, this is illustrated as hemispheres, which are pushed together. Well, hemispheres don't really work. What you have is um, a tube or sort of rings uh, that you shoot onto a stick. Um, and this works with uranium, and this is sort of the, the simplest uh, way in which a nuclear bomb can be assembled. This doesn't work with plutonium um, for complicated nuclear physics kinds of reasons. Uh, the fission reaction starts uh, too early because of too many prompt neutrons. Um, but anyway, this only works with uranium. Now, the other way uh, of doing it is what's called an implosion-type device. And there you have a hollow sphere, so that means you have plutonium, not, not in a compressed ball, but a ball with a hole in the middle, if you will. Um, and there is a very, very intricate and complicated set of explosives around it, and at, at the moment of ignition, these explosives compress the ball into a hard sphere, into a smaller sphere, and that then is a critical mass. Um, and this initiates the runaway reaction, uh, which makes the bomb explode. Um, you can make these kinds of setups smaller and lighter, which is why practically all the nuclear weapon states have gone to this implosion-type device as opposed to the gun-type device. Um, you can put tritium or deuterium, or a mixture of both, inside, and this calls boosting. So you have the same nuclear weapon that would explode as it is, um, and it would make some big explosion, but then you can put tritium or deuterium in it, and the explosion will be even bigger. Which is why these actually pretty harmless isotopes of hydrogen that are deuterium and tritium um, are actually relevant to the proliferation of nuclear weapons, because it's a material that you can use for boosting. Um, to show you how far this development can go, um, you see here the Davy Crockett, which is a nuclear device, uh, a nuclear bomb that uh, was developed by the US military and stationed here in Germany even. And this is as bad an idea as it looks. Um, <laughs> the ratio, so meaning how far this thing can fly, is somewhere between two and four kilometers. <laughs> yeah. And the radius at which it will give you a lethal, a deadly dose of radiation is about one kilometer. So you have to be a very good shot and very, good sh very sure of the wind direction and everything. And it, well, it wasn't never used in the field, luckily, of course, like many other weapons. Um, but yeah, they also had this. Um, then we come to what's called the hydrogen bomb, or a thermonuclear device, uh, or in technical terms, the teller ulam design. This all means basically the same thing, which is that you take the normal nuclear weapon, as if it weren't bad enough as it is, um, and you smack on a, a sort of fusion assembly, is what it's called, and this ordinary nuclear bomb then ignites the fusion part of it, which makes for a much, much bigger explosion. Um, and to illustrate how much bigger uh, this explosion can get. Now, I have scaled these icons, which you see there, the little speck between the gun type and the 15 kiloton. Um, this scales by area of the icon with uh, the explosive yield, so the, the size and the destructive force of the explosion of the other types that I'm going to add now, which is the boosted implosion type, which is sort of the biggest um, 
the biggest conventional type nuclear weapon that you can build without any fusion involved. Um, and then we have the biggest fusion weapons that have ever been invented. Uh, and this, of course, I think many will recognize, is a photograph of the Tsar Bomba explosion, which was a about 60 megaton explosion that the Soviet Union did in 1961. Um, after deciding that they wouldn't go for the 100 megaton, which they had actually designed it for, because they didn't really know what it might do to the Earth's atmosphere or anything. Um, so that was the biggest explosion that ever happened. Actually, the sound wave, you know the shock, if you're standing anywhere in the next... 100 kilometers of this, you will hear a big noise. This shock sound wave traveled around the Earth three times, and they measured it in Norway and in Australia and everywhere after this one explosion. So that was a very big one. But for now, I would like to go back and focus on these small explosions, um, because sadly enough, these are the only types of explosions that have, well, no, um, Sad as it is, they have been used in war, and this was the explosion um, that was caused by it. Um, by which I mean the attacks on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki um, in 1945. So these were bombs, um, one of the very simple gun type, a uranium assembly, and one of the Im implosion type with plutonium that had been tested before in the Trinity test of 1944, which was the first nuclear explosion that ever happened on Earth. Um, with the gun type assembly, and I've told you, you shoot a, a ring onto a stick, this assembly was so simple that they did not test it before. The first time this type of explosion ever happened was when it destroyed a city. Um, okay, so that was where it was used in war, and when this happens, um, the effects of the bomb are actually manifold. It's not just one thing blows it all away. Um, the explosive blast, that means the air that is pushed, um, that is about a little less than half of all the energy, the total energy that is released. Uh, the heat radiation makes for another about half, and only 5%, you may say, uh, goes into radiation. But, of course, given how big the explosion is, this can still do uh, substantial damage, uh, especially to living beings. And uh, with a device called a neutron bomb, um, which is actually just a regular... Um, a regular nuclear bomb uh, with some materials and some different radioactive metals added to uh, increase the output of radioactivity in this explosion, it can go up to about 20 to 30 percent of the total energy released in the form of radiation. Now, the effects, of course, uh, are well known. This is a before and after picture of the city of Hiroshima, and uh, well, yes, it's a river, and yes, there are buildings between it, and then there aren't. Um, and this is what the cityscape looked like um, after the explosion. And this, as I said, was just about under half of the total destructive energy that went into, you know, flattening these buildings. Now, the other almost half um, went into heat radiation that can instantly, and with the speed of light, literally, set things on fire uh, at a distance. Now, the thing that you see on the left is the shadow of this um, ring kind of device that you see there. So the bomb exploded to the left and front of the picture, and where the heat radiation hit the wall between, it, uh, well, created some sort of ash, I would guess, and uh, made the wall lighter. But where it hit the metal, um, this didn't happen, and so it leaves a shadow. And uh, a similar thing happened to the woman uh, who is photographed on the right. Um, the burn marks on her back, this is going to be the only picture of injured people, I'm sorry. Uh, I will show this, but it's very um, illustrative. Um, the burn marks on her back um, match the pattern of color that was on her clothing. And where the clothing was darker, there was more heat radiation absorbed. Um, and this meant that the skin was burned worse than in other places where the garment was not as light or was not touching um, her skin at the moment of the explosion. Um, now, the third thing, of course, the radiation causes radiation poisoning. It destroys uh, the DNA in human cells, and this leads to reproductive errors, which uh, leads to a very ugly sickness, and I chose not to put any pictures of it in it. Um, now, this sickness um, usually has a time of several days it takes before the really bad effects set in. So most of the people were sort of walking around, uh, well, yeah, some of them were walking around the day after the explosion, um, wondering what happened, and then many of them additionally had to go and find medical help because then only they realized that they contracted some sort of sickness as an after effect of the explosion, which of course was not known. They thought there was some sort of uh, incredibly powerful bomb and now the city is gone, but hey, I'm alive. 
Um, but then this after effect of radioactivity and radiation poisoning set in, which was not known, so people didn't know what was happening to them. This uh, was made especially worse because rain falling through the uh, ash, uh, the radioactive ash of the fallout uh, from the burning of the city, um, the water, rain falling, washed out this ash and uh, got into people's systems because they were drinking the water because obviously there was no other form of water supply available at the time. So it's a pretty, pretty bad weapon. Um, now to get back on a lighter note, let's see what would happen if this happened with a modern bomb on a modern city and let's say the United States chose to bomb this Congress. Um, with a 10 megaton bomb, which is the biggest device that they have invented, um, why? Well, it's something about Snowden and the NSA and, you know, there's probably lots of reasons. Um, now, this may sound funny, but think about it. With drone strikes, this is about the way it works, right? There's some guy and there's some people next to him, but I ah, bomb them anyway. So, what would happen? Um, we see here a map of the city of Hamburg and... Uh, this is a wonderful tool called NukeMap. I've put the address there. And you can calculate. You just give it some location on a map, and it knows about population densities and stuff. You can even simulate wind direction, fallout, everything. Um, so if they chose with this large weapon to bomb Congress, then the city of Hamburg would be pretty much gone. Um, at least half the population would be dead. There would be a crater two kilometers in diameter, and pretty much all the populated areas of the city would have their buildings flattened. So, that is what would happen. Now, think about the destructive power of just one of these weapons, and now observe how many there are, and um, you will see that uh, the United States and Russia, what used to be the Soviet Union, um, have the largest number of uh, these nuclear weapons, and then there's small numbers in... Um, small numbers of nuclear weapons in just a handful of other countries. And the terms that we use to describe these situations is vertical proliferation for the number of nuclear weapons that are in some place. Now, this tells us that for vertical proliferation, the USA and Russia are the biggest, well, the biggest problems. Um, and for horizontal proliferation, um, we might find it interesting to find out how we can prevent more countries from getting nuclear weapons or even reducing the number of countries so that we can focus better on disarming those that are there. Um, now, for vertical proliferation, this is a time chart of how many weapons, um, how many nuclear warheads the United States and the Soviet Union or Russia had at different points in time. And we can see that it was basically growing um, in a bit different, uh, you know, in distinct fashions. This is all to do with economies and, and politics of the Cold War. I'm not going to get very much into that. Um, but one interesting feature we can see um, is that at the beginning of the 90s, there was this rapid decline in the arsenals of both states. And this was due to contracts that these two countries um, negotiated that would say, okay, the prospective destruction, if one of us, two, chose to attack the other, is bad enough as it is, we might as well, you know, limit the number of nuclear warheads uh, just to have some sort of calculability. There was this notion that... Um, you could really plan and then you could control the idea of nuclear war if it had broken out. Um, and, well, these number games of reducing the number of weapons that you have, they were a big tool. As you can see, for almost, um, yeah, for most of the decades, um, there have been different treaties in effect. And as it now stands, both of these countries will, should not have um, more than a couple of thousand nuclear warheads and active duty. Um, but verification is a big problem. I'm going to, um, present this uh, at the end a little bit. Pro um, verification means that, well, okay, now they agree. They've signed a contract. Okay, you get rid of some of your weapons, and you get rid of some of your weapons. Now prove it. Well, this is extremely difficult, because obviously Russia is not going to let um, United States nuclear engineers just walk into their uh, building, you know, bomb building building, um, and start to take them apart or look at the construction plans or anything. Ah, you have to involve other countries, you have to involve technical methods, there's things called information barriers, and it gets really, really complicated. Um, okay, so that much for the vertical proliferation, which, as we've seen, uh, leaves us with a large enough number uh, we have at the moment. Uh, oh yeah, this was one uh, funny treaty that the United States and Russia signed in 1994. Um, this was the detargeting treaty, which, uh, in which both parties um, assured the other, okay, we're not pointing our missiles at you anymore. If there was a missile that could be set to some target, we would set it, the target to undefined. Or if it's a rocket that absolutely needs a target to operate, we will set it into the ocean. 
This is the uh, Minuteman 3 rocket that is still deployed in the United States. But how difficult do you think it would be and how much time do you think it would take to actually load a new set of targets right into the 1960s mode? Well, <laughs> no, not at all. This was a symbolic treaty, but that doesn't mean it was useless. You know, it was a gesture that defined much of the atmosphere of the early and mid-90s um, and the negotiations for disarmament of these weapons and other sorts of weapons. Uh, this is what's called a trust-building measures. Now, to get into the mindset of the 1960s, which was when uh, one of the most important uh, treaties of um, nuclear disarmament was signed, I'd like to present you with a very short song um, written and sung by Tom Lehrer, an American political comedian that only had a very short career um, of absolutely brilliant political satire in the United States in the 60s. We're going to be listening to him to get a feeling of what people were thinking about nuclear proliferation in the 1960s. First we got the bomb, and that was good, cause we love peace and motherhood. Then Russia got the bomb, but that's okay, cause the balance of powers maintained that way. Who's next? France got the bomb, but don't you grieve, cause they're on our side, I believe. China got the bomb, but have no fears, they can't wipe us out for at least five years. Who's next? So, uh, I'll just pause here for a second. Um, he's asking who's next, and um, the things that he, he's describing, uh, without the mention of the United Kingdom, which apparently didn't matter much at all to him, um, <laughs> five nations had uh, managed to develop nuclear weapons by themselves and tested them successfully, and even developed fusion devices, which you see on the bottom timeline. Um, France, he says, is on our side, I believe, by which he means that France developed, even though it's a sort of a member of NATO, um, it developed the nuclear force explicitly to be separate from NATO. So uh, different from the United Kingdom, which has its nuclear arsenal integrated into NATO, France wanted this as a tool for, uh, you know, to maintain and guarantee their sovereignty. Um, okay, now we're going to be listening to Tom Lehrer, what he thinks is going to happen after that. Uh, then Indonesia claimed that they were going to get one any day. South Africa wants two, that's right. One for the black and one for the white. Who's next? Egypt's gonna get one too, just to use on you know who. So Israel's getting tense, wants one in self-defense. The Lord is our shepherd, says the psalm. But just in case, we better get a bomb. <laughs> Who's next? A Luxembourg is next to go. And who knows, maybe Monaco. We'll try to stay serene and calm when Alabama gets the bomb. Who's next? Who's next? Who's next? So that was that, apparently. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Tom. Now, luckily, Luxembourg and Monaco did not happen. Um, and I've been unable to find out, I bet someone of you could tell me, if there are actually nuclear weapons stationed in the state of Alabama in the United States. As Tom Lehrer indicates, that might be a cause for concern. Um, so what did happen next, right? He mentioned Indonesia. Not going to be talking about that much anymore uh, because it didn't turn out to be an important player, but uh, Israel, obviously. Um, and so let's see what happens. So in this climate, in 1968, um, the International Atomic Agency was founded um, and had brokered this uh, nuclear, nuclear non-proliferation treaty that was meant to prevent a larger number of states getting nuclear weapons. And the deal is there. Um, the deal is five states can ever have nuclear weapons. Um, and that is the USA, Russia, the UK, France, and China, which had managed to do so by that point. Um, everyone else can never have nuclear weapons, but they can get nuclear reactors, you know, for power generation and the economy and everything. Um, and there will be safeguards, which means that the IAEA will maintain a presence and will make inspections in order to watch that uh, there is no nuclear material, you know, uh, uh, um, made 
push to the side for nuclear weapons construction, which in the end did happen though, uh, which is why I've outlined that point in red. Non-nuclear weapon states do get nuclear energy technology, and that is a problem for nuclear weapons proliferation. It's just a fact. Um, okay, as you see, uh, the big five and a large number of other states actually find this a great deal. Five states in the world currently do not. And we're going to be looking at who these five states are and what happened there. Um, so, um, first is Israel, which already in the 1960s managed to, um, as it is thought, managed to develop nuclear weapons. Um, now, the technologi technological help from France and Germany has been pretty well documented, but it's every everything is very secret. And Israel has never admitted to possessing nuclear weapons. It's sort of an open secret in the community. It, it gets very, very awkward at diplomatic meetings because they will be like, okay, the nuclear weapon states and everybody looks at Israel and Israel is like, what? Um, <laughs> their, their official policy is that they would not be the first to introduce nuclear weapons in the Middle East. That's the most you know, explicit thing anyone's ever gotten them to say. Okay, the next state now, uh, we're talking about 10 years later, uh, is India, which uh, managed by means of uh, very, you know, industrious work and some brilliant nuclear physicists like Baba, um, managed to develop nuclear weapons of their own. Uh, and the first nuclear test that they conducted was in 1974. It was called the Smiling Buddha Test, and they declared it a peaceful explosion. <laughs> okay. This led, because they were in breach of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, actually to a nuclear embargo. That should mean that no other state in the world that has signed the treaty could sell any nuclear power technology to India. But in the course of the decades, it turned out that India is too interesting a market for power companies um, to actually be bound by things like international contracts. And so now, um, the United States and other um, companies and uh, economic actors are happily selling nuclear technology to India. India is very explicit in saying that the non-proliferation treaty is unfair because some states get to have nuclear weapons and other states can never have nuclear weapons. And it would join the contract if they were awarded the status of the sixth nuclear power in the world. Um, okay, Pakistan. Um, they were motivated by conflict and by the breakup of their country, which ended in the, uh, in the founding of uh, Bangladesh and very... A uh, very troublesome history. They also managed with some ingenuity of their own, especially by this gentleman, a metallurgist and nuclear physicist called Abdul Qadir Khan, um, to develop nuclear weapons. But he had big help uh, from uh, a Urenco, which is a company that makes you know nuclear power technology in the Netherlands, where he worked legally and looked at some documents and took some documents home and maybe shipped some materials home. And in the end, Pakistan was in possession of a nuclear bomb through totally you know peaceful nuclear power, uh, which where he had managed to circumvent uh, the safeguards or where there had been lax or even no safeguards uh, in place. Um, the, a funny thing is, Abdul Qadir Khan has been suspected of having helped other countries, uh, you know, try and implement a nuclear weapons program of their own, um, Iraq, Libya, um, North Korea. And so, by some countries, he is considered to be, you know, a criminal because he has been proliferating nuclear weapons throughout the world. In Pakistan, though, he is considered an honored citizen and he has received high honors um, because they see it as an essential tool of uh, maintaining and, and uh, securing the sovereignty of their state. Um, now, North Korea has also managed, as the last country um, in, historically, um, to develop nuclear weapons. Uh, they are guided by their uh, ideology of self-reliance, you know, of never relying on anybody or any actor other than themselves. And this, of course, means that to have very uh, powerful weapons under your control is a useful thing. Again, here, um, Abdul Qadir Khan was implicated in having helped nuclear um, development in North Korea. The first. Uh, nuclear test that North Korea conducted was in 2006, and that was actually the first test that had happened then in eight years. And we're going to be seeing that that actually was a big deal. So, uh, here's the updated uh, conversation about the um, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, where you see what the countries are thinking of all this. India doesn't like it. Pakistan agrees with India, the only thing where they do. Um, South Sudan, um, they have nothing to do with nuclear weapons at all. They're just so new, they haven't gotten around to signing it. Um, okay, so this was the... Um, yeah, and historically, there have been other cases. South Africa was also mentioned in the song by Tom Lehrer, and they actually were seeking to develop nuclear weapons. 
Um, they were motivated more by, you know, securing a strategic political position, which uh, is also manifested in the fact that they developed these bulky uh, um, gun-type devices with uranium, uranium which they had acquired by agreements with Israel. Um, and there have been no known, there's a small caveat which you're going to see later, there have been no nuclear tests conducted by South Africa as far as we know. Um, and luckily, the political shift that set in in South Africa um, at the end of the apartheid regime at the beginning of the 90s led to them abandoning their um, nuclear ambitions, submitting to IAEA safeguards, joining the non-proliferation treaty and ending you know, their nuclear episode. And they're the first and only country to really have done so in this way so far. Um, so that's good. Go South Africa. Okay, um, these three states, the Ukraine, Kazakhstan and Belarus, became nuclear states overnight um, in a cold winter night in 1991, and you may guess how that happened. Um, well, the state that had formerly possessed the nuclear weapons just wasn't there anymore, and they suddenly found that, okay, we're a new state now. Oh, we have nukes. Um, <laughs> now, the control that they exerted was limited because the weapons were placed on their territory, but they didn't have really operational control. They didn't have all the codes. Um, they didn't necessarily have officers of their own uh, who knew how to operate everything. So it w was more of a bargaining chip, but it was, very, um, uh, it was very valuable to them. And in an enormous act of uh, negotiation, um, it was managed to, um, to convince them to give up these nuclear weapons, to ship them back to Russia um, in exchange for money and guarantees of security, uh, meaning, for example, that Russia, as the former hegemonial power of the Soviet Union, would never invade any of these states. That was 20 years ago, and Ukraine is not amused. Okay, um, some other cases. Um, the the non-proliferation treaty just took, you know, a, a point in time to define for whom it is okay to have nuclear weapons and for whom it isn't. And other states that might, you know, technologically have been um, able to develop nuclear weapons of their own. You can find some lists where some names are floating around. Sweden, surprisingly, is uh, mentioned a couple of times. Germany, Japan. But then they had uh, political incentives not to do that. Um, but some states do think it is unfair that just at some point in time it was okay to develop nuclear weapons and now it isn't for anyone else. Um, They've even had military force used against them. On the right, we see satellite pictures. The upper one is from the 1980s in Iraq, and the lower one is from 2006 in Syria, where the Israeli military bombed um, these, uh, these installations for fear of there being a production of nuclear weapons ongoing. Um, and other states that have listed here you know, have had political pressure um, put on them. Um, and prevented them from becoming nuclear states, which in the long run I, I think is a good idea because the less nuclear states we have, the better. But especially um, looking at the countries that did succeed, even though they were in breach of the non-proliferation treaty, like uh, India, Pakistan, um, this leads to a lot of resentment between certain groups of countries, especially uh, between some Arab countries and Israel. Okay, so, uh, yeah, this is one, one big fuck-up of the West now, of Europe. Um, sharing is caring, as we know and the United States is sharing their nuclear weapons with us in a program called Nuclear Sharing. Um, United States nuclear weapons are stationed in five countries in Europe, Germany, Italy, Turkey, Belgium, and the Netherlands. Now, they're stationed there. The nukes are inside non-nuclear weapon states under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Isn't that sort of breaching the Non-Proliferation Treaty? Well, I think yes, and most sensible people think that this is a breach of the treaty, and the United States and NATO should not be doing that. They have a position on this, if you ask them, how can you be stationing nuclear weapons in Germany? And they say, well, they're only stationed, you know, we didn't give them away, they're under our control. But German pilots are trained on um, fighter jets, if they work, um, <laughs> to throw these nuclear weapons. There is training going on to train German military pilots to throw a nuclear bomb. The United States say, no, nah, you know, they're just looking out for them. And this is a, this is a real screamer. Um, the, the NATO and the United States say, the non-proliferation treaty is meant to keep the peace. If nuclear war breaks out, then there's no peace anymore. So it's okay if we give away the weapons, even in peacetime, because they're meant for war. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, <laughs> there's no better explanation. Uh, okay, so we might ask ourselves, is the non-proliferation treaty working? You know, are we preventing states from getting nuclear weapons or is it just one big unfair fuck up of treaties? Uh, well, you can, I, I'd like to look at it this way. At the middle of the 20th century, it was relatively hard to develop nuclear weapons, and five states did so over the course of 20 years, and they were well-developed nations with large scientific resources. Um, after that, after the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty had been signed, in 50 years, only four other countries have joined the ranks of these unofficially, even though nuclear power and reactor technology has become much more widely available, and in terms of the spread of knowledge about all these systems and the weapons, it has actually become easier to attain nuclear weapons. So, I guess we can say um, that the Non-Proliferation Treaty is sort of working for most of us. Um, let's get to another topic. Uh, which is nuclear testing. You take a bomb that you have developed and you're so proud of the bomb, you want to show everybody how well it works, and you explode it somewhere. And you take data and you, you being all sciencey about it. Um, and some <laughs> states have gotten some really horrible ideas about that. This is a picture of the US military. They used to do this kind of thing in the 1950s. Um, but other states have also had some, some very bad ideas about nuclear testing, like France. Take a nice holiday, paradise, Pacific Atoll, and decide to bomb the shit out of it. <laughs> that poor thing. Okay, um, so nuclear testing is obviously destructive, disruptive, and we're going to be looking, about, looking at what it does. Um, worldwide nuclear testing, this is a chart of how many nuclear test explosions have been done by what country over the course of the century. And there's two main features, I think, of this graph uh, that we can focus at and uh, try to find out what's happening there. Um, again, we see that the United States and the Soviet Union or Russia uh, make up most of the problem, um, most of the testing. Um, and then we see this gap at the end of the 50s. What happened there? There was practically no nuclear tests in 1958 and 59. Um, and then they sort of end at the beginning of the 90s. You know, there is some tests, but compared to 10 or 20 years before, nuclear testing has all but stopped. Um, and we're going to be looking at why this happened. Now, two treaties have been crucial in um, shaping this set of affairs. That is the Partial Test Ban Treaty of 1963 and the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty of 1996 in very different situations, of course, one during the height of the Cold War and the other after it had ended. Now, the Partial Test Ban Treaty uh, prohibits nuclear test explosions in the atmosphere, in the open air, in outer space, they did that, um, and underwater, um, which kind of looked nicer, I guess, or something. Um, so this is not allowed anymore, and most of the states and most of the important players signed this treaty. France uh, and China have never signed it, and they have conducted atmospheric and underwater nuclear tests after the 1960s, but they mostly stopped in the 80s uh, and 90s. France was the last, actually, the last of the um, five nuclear weapon states, the five allowed nuclear weapon states to make tests, and that was in 1998. North Korea has also not signed, but overall, it was a pretty uh, effective treaty. Why did they sign this treaty? Well, isotopes, that means uh, types of nuclear atoms um, that are formed in nuclear explosions and only in nuclear explosions, um, have been released into the atmosphere in large numbers because there was a lot of testing going on. And this released nuclear materials into the atmosphere and, of course, by currents and rain and everything, they managed to spread all around the world. Um, and two uh, were especially important, that is cesium-137 and strontium-90. Um, and they were found actually in children's teeth and in milk. And uh, this happened in the 50s and 60s in the United States. They asked school children to send in their milk teeth, the first teeth that fell out, uh, you know, when they were growing up, uh, and send them in for science in order to find out if nuclear testing actually affected them. And the result was yes, yes. Um, children that lived in states where nuclear testing was happening or was nearby had higher levels of these isotopes in their system. And I want to point you to... Um, the article, uh, you can find it there, it's a publication called The Appendix. Dear Science, it says, my name is Kathy. That's just, that's just so sweet. Okay, but it's macabre, of course. They were asked to send in, you know, parts of their bodies to see how radioactive they were. Um, okay, this is levels now of um, 
these isotopes in the, uh, in the atmosphere. And you can see in the left graph that the levels were steadily rising. The, um, the green curve is in Austria, so it's the northern hemisphere. And the, southern, uh, the red curve is the southern hemisphere, where it took a little bit longer to, um, to spread around the globe because much of the testing was done on the northern hemisphere. Um, so we can see that, well, okay, the axis is actually not very fairly put. You can see that um, this is the natural level of about um, uh, of about 100, uh, what do we have there actually, mega curies, yeah, it's a unit for radioactivity. Um, and it rose to almost double the natural levels on the northern hemisphere uh, in the 1960s. And this concerned politicians and concerned the public. And so there was talk of, you know, stopping nuclear explosions in the atmosphere, and that was what happened. Now I'd like to point you to the graph on the right, um, which you will notice is marked in French, and <laughs> it is for a very good reason. Um, there also we see levels of radioactivity rising over the course of time and peaking in the 1960s before then falling off over a longer period of time. Now, what is this data? Well, a French nuclear uh, research institution in Bordeaux put bottles of red wine in a gamma spectrometer and they looked for lines of cesium-137, the signature um, of this isotope. Now, this specific isotope, as I said, is not does not naturally occur on Earth, but only when nuclear explosions happen. Uh, so they actually devised uh, a way to find out for some bottle of wine if it could credibly come from before the 50s or not, because if there's any trace of cesium-137 in it, it must have been, you know, closed in the 50s or later. Um, and so they did that, and this, of course, affected... This is useful for art history, you know, finding out when a picture was sealed or something. For many kinds of things, you can just um, you can just look at stuff in terms of did it happen before or after the start of nuclear testing. Um, now, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty is a treaty with a very simple purpose, and it's rather short, and it says, don't cause nuclear explosions. Don't call them peaceful, like India did. <laughs> don't try to hide it, just don't. Um, and the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization um, is supposed to look over this treaty and uh, its operation is being prepared by a preparatory commission which leads to this kind of bulky name of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization Preparatory Commission. Um, <laughs> I've had the chance to practice. Um, so, they are setting up um, a network to see where nuclear explosions happen and they have a big campaign going on of raising awareness for nuclear testing and the problem that it poses because as I said nuclear testing has not happened much in the world over the last 20 years there's not as big a sense of that being a problem you know of nuclear testing being an actual problem and a danger as there was for example in the 1960s and though they sponsored a video um, that is called 1945 to 98 by an artist named Isao Hashimoto um, and it's got this sort of video game you know of visuals, uh, and it shows all the nuclear explosions that happened over the course of these years. Um, and it's got eerie sound effects, it's about 15 minutes long, and it's very depressing and eerie to watch. Now, of course, we don't have the time for that, and I found out, I, I don't know if this will be funny or horribly inappropriate, but we'll see. Um, if you speed this up real fast and give it funny music, then, okay, let's look at it. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Hashimoto, I'm very sorry. Um, so uh, you may have wondered about the explosions going on in Africa. That was France, because they didn't want nuclear explosions in their own country. They had Algeria for that. Okay, so the CTBTO PrepCom um, is an organization that is supposed to find out when a nuclear test is happening. And this is not as easy as it seems. Um, they had a big, big field exercise going on in Jordan just a couple of weeks ago where hundreds or even thousands of, you know, officers and technicians um, went to Jordan and had a big exercise of what it would look like to actually inspect somewhere where they suspect that a nuclear explosion might have taken place. They will collect air samples, they will collect ground samples, they will collect witness testimony um, and then try to find out if in some state that is being inspected there has been a nuclear explosion. Um, why is this hard? Well, we have a case a study which we can look at, and that is the Vela incident, um, which describes something that happened um, 
on a, uh, on a day in 1979 in the southern Indian Ocean. The United States had, for a large amount of money and over a long time, uh, developed a specialized set of satellites to look for nuclear explosions. They were equipped with cameras and with radiation detectors, and they were sent you know, all around the world to look for nuclear explosions. And then something happened, but they can't really say if it was a nuclear explosion. <laughs> This is the definition of you had one job and failed. Um, <laughs> But much of it is classified, um, so we can't really know. There is a theory, you could almost call it a conspiracy theory, nothing is confirmed, um, that it may have been a joint operation by South Africa and Israel, uh, which would be, if this were true, and there is nothing to support that, I want to stress this, um, the only test that South Africa or Israel had ever conducted. Um, But the satellites were not useless after all. They, at one time, found that radiation was coming from the wrong direction, from outer space. And this led to the discovery of gamma ray bursts in other galaxies, which was a big deal for astrophysics. So, all right. Thank you, Vela program. Okay, so. The CTBTO is setting, up this, um, is setting up this measurement network, and it's a very intricate and large network. We see at the top left an infrasound station uh, in some barren part of Norway. In the top right, we see a radionuclide, a radioactivity measurement station in China, in Peking. Um, at the bottom left, there is an... Um, There is a, what's it called? A seismic measurement station in Niger, in Africa. And to the bottom right, there is a hydroacoustic, so a sound traveling through water measurement station near the South Pole. And they have set up, um, I think it is, more than a thousand stations by now that span all around the globe. And they started only about 15 years ago. So that's a job well done. And now, if something like the Vela incident were to happen again, they had a good chance of finding out if it was a nuclear explosion or not. Um, the only chance that they had of trying out the system of sensors and everything was for the North Korean nuclear test of 2006 and the subsequent two tests that North Korea has done. Now, nobody will ever admit that they might have been happy that, nuclear, that North Korea conducted a nuclear test because there's nothing to be happy about, but it was a test for this network that they set up where they couldn't really do much of simulation, so it was a real-world test. That was at least interesting. Um, and they managed to confirm that there that actually was a nuclear test there. Um, what's the problem? So the CDBT sounds pretty nice, okay? Testing has almost stopped. We've got this measurement set up, network set up. We've got the CTBTO working on it all, spreading awareness. Um, well, the treaty is not in effect. It's just, you know, uh, a bunch of people have signed, work has started, but it's not an effective treaty. It's not binding yet. Um, and this is because the treaty has sort of a, a self-limiting uh, provision that only if certain states sign and ratify the treaty it will become effective. Uh, and the signatures and ratifications that are missing, uh, I've laid out there, the USA. Um, Barack Obama, when he ran for his first presidential term, promised that he would really go for it and try to push Congress to uh, ratify the CTBT. Uh, but then nothing happened. Of course, he doesn't have much control over Congress, and they just don't want to do it, because they say that for the safety of the United States, it is essential to retain at least the possibility of starting nuclear tests again, even if they haven't done so for almost 25 years now. Um, so that's a problem, um, but we can see, again, uh, as well as with the non-proliferation treaty, it's sort of an awkward position of things half working and half not working, because nuclear tests have, de facto, almost stopped. Um, when the treaty was signed in 1996, only a couple of tests by India, Pakistan, France... Um, oh, I did wrong by France. I said their last test was in 98. It was in 96. Um, so very few tests happened. Um, And it's almost working, even though the treaty, as I said, is not in effect. So, okay, we, I guess we should push for more ratification. Now, to the part of me telling you what you can do and what everyone can do and what I would like you know, people to get involved in and think about uh, when it comes to nuclear weapons. Hackers, that is what this conference is about, by a large part. Um, you can look uh, up a talk by Moritz Kutt, um, where he does a great summary of the technological problems of nuclear disarmament. Um, you can find it on the Media CCC repository. Um, and there he will say, there, as I said, there's things like information barriers and stuff like that. Um, and there's a lot of hard work to be done. And uh, if you look at Moritz's talk, then you can find out where you could help if you're a coder or you know, you're into hardware and stuff. Um, okay, this slide I've been looking forward to for months since I thought of that talk. Um, If you are a citizen of some specific country, then this might help you, you know, choose a path where you'd like to push your government to do something. I'm very interested. Is there someone from Pakistan or India in the audience? 
Okay, pity. I don't see anybody. But if you're listening in, um, you could use, you know, your democratic pressure to um, to push for CTBT signature. No, of course, yeah, North Korea. That is a bit awkward. I wouldn't want them to push their government for anything. <laughs> and I actually, I don't even want to joke about it. So. Um, Okay, but even citizens, you know, of these countries here in Europe, we should get rid of the nuclear sharing program of NATO. And, uh, and it would be a big help if the CTBT actually went into effect finally. Now, what everyone can do, regardless of where they live uh, or where they work, um, what needs to be done, we need to find a concept that sort of replaces the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty because it's unfair as certain countries think, and it doesn't really fit into the times anymore. Um, the CTBTO, this wonderful organization helping to set up this network, needs help, uh, especially with publicity, because they're not very well known, but they're doing great work. Um, you can do that, you can find them on Twitter, they put out a lot of great stuff. Um, and we need to solve the problem of proliferation through nuclear power, because where there are nuclear reactors, there is a chance of someone developing weapons, and this needs to be solved somehow. We could devise better reactors, we could get rid of nuclear power, there's different ways, but we just have to find one. Or, in, in the end, what we all might do is just do away with goddamn nuclear weapons. Um, this may be a long way off, but I hope we'll get there. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, we now have about 10 minutes of Q&A. If you absolutely insist on leaving now, please be very, very quiet to not disturb the Q&A. And if you can just stay until the end of the talk, it's only 10 more minutes. We have six mics. There's one, two, three, four, five, and six in the back. So just line up after the microphone so, we, so I can see who, has to, who wants to ask a question. Also, if you're in the chat, there's the ISC, and we have a human computer interface here to read them out. So please, microphone number one. Yeah, hi, Michael. Moin. Nuclear physics and medical physics got something to remark. At first, right now, we are seeing China deploying these days the first submersional, submersional nuclear missile crisis. So they are joining the submarine force with nuclear rockets for second strike capabil capability right now. And of course, it is possible to build a nuclear arm of uh, natural uranium. It will only weigh 30 tons, so you can't deploy it, but it works. And uh, the hollow shell loads have the advantage of producing more power because you don't need the metal shell to increase the combustion. So, as you produce the pressure to the inside, you keep the stuff together, so, so more Could you fission material is done. So, my uh, question is, where did you got, get the data from uh, pollution in Japan after the nuclear strikes? That wasn't data about uh, pollution in Japan. Is, so, is... you ma mentioned it in the sheet. But this I is a, this, uh, to the left, this is a NOAA model, this just no, models... No, 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 referring on World War II. Excuse me? Referring on World, World War II. So, there is... Oh, I well, do those not are estimates, any... of course. Those are estimates, of course. There were, no, uh, there were no real good measurement methods, and if they were, then the, no data was ever published. Uh, oh, oh, yes. Uh, okay, could you please carry on the discussion after the talk? We have only a few minutes of Q&A. Internet, please go ahead. <laughs> Internet is slow today. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> does the comprehensive test ban apply to private persons? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, I don't think so, but uh, it's, it's geared towards state actors. You know, it's not a bad yeah. question, but uh, most of the countries have laws that say you can't cause a nuclear explosion. Um, you can look this up in the German uh, Strafgesetzbuch, where it says, das Herbeiführen einer nuklearen Explosion wird mit einer Freiheitsstrafe von nicht weniger als fünf Jahren bestraft. Thank you. 
for our English speaking listeners, that means that you have to go to jail for five years if you cause a nuclear explosion. Microphone number three, please. Hello. In the 2600 magazine recently, there was an article stating that the Minuteman missile is locally controlled and after a countdown expires, it can be controlled remotely. It also stated that the Minuteman crews had turned this into a game where they would allow the countdown to get as close to zero as possible before resetting it. Have you heard about this? Can you state on its accuracy? And have any other countries done anything similar? Uh, I'm not aware of this report, but there has been a report that was widely publicized, uh, John Oliver's uh, you know, television show, where they talked about bad things happening in the United States, uh, nuclear force, there was cheating going on during safety tests and things like this, so um, it wouldn't surprise me very much. There, during the Cold War, they developed this mindset of, you know, it's, it's all just big numbers. You cannot imagine a million dead people if you push one button. So you just kind of go crazy and think it's a game or something. That's what happens. Number four, please. Yes, I have a rather short question. Don't you think we need nuclear weapons now to deter Vladimir Putin from, the, from doing nasty things? Well, no, because Russia and the United States are both nuclear powers and there is not much sense in threatening someone with the use of nuclear force ever, especially Putin, if they Putin have does. theirs of their own. Putin does. Well, yes, but so do many others and I don't want the war escalating, so let's not threaten anyone with that. Internet. In Hashimoto Isao's uh, video, you can see month-long pauses of no nuclear tests at all. Only when someone starts again, other countries immediately, immediately react by tests of their own. Um, um, is there some kind of, of ping-pong going on? <laughs> Good question. Um, I guess, well, some of this may be, you know, the inaccuracy of the records of when exactly the tests did happen, though that is actually pretty well documented. No, I would say the testing mostly happened in, um, in campaigns. They would do a shot of five nuclear tests over, let's say, a week, uh, and then there would be a pause of several, um, of several weeks or months before the next campaign started. Um, so I would, I would say that during the 60s, which was where we saw the video from, this was mostly coincidence. But of course, um, in 1998, in the case of India and Pakistan, that was not a coincidence. India conducted a nuclear test, and within a week after that, Pakistan conducted a nuclear test, and that was clearly a reaction. Mic number one, please. Yes, uh, thank you for this excellent talk. I want to add a little uh, detail when it comes to the Comprehensive Testman Treaty. Um, so basically, one of the backgrounds that the U.S. pushed in the 90s for, the, for this treaty was that um, the nuclear weapons um, community deemed their simulation capacities good enough mm -hmm. not to conduct any real tests anymore. So the Clinton administrative sort of forged a diplomatic initiative out of it and basically went ahead and pushed other countries to sign this because they were confident that they can test the weapons virtually. And apparently they gave some codes to China and France sort of did this test to recalibrate their models in 96. And um, now basically the time um, that in the 90s they thought they need uh, or that, that they could guarantee this um, has run out. So basically they said 20 years out this, which is now, is um, what we can guarantee our weapons to, to work. Ah. Um, this is called the Nuclear um, Stockpile Stewardship Program, and they do verification in, in the functionality of the weapons and guarantee the military commanders that they work. So my question now is, do you expect new tests to happen uh, in the coming years because all those designs from the 70s, 80s are not verified anymore? Or will they continue to rely on... Uh, computer simulations in this? Well, the simulation capabilities, of course, have become much, much better uh, since the 90s. And so actually there is a bigger chance of, you know, making successful tests um, with simulations only. But it is true that nuclear weapons degrade over time. After some decades, you can't say for sure how the materials um, have changed. So you're not sure if they work. Well, I just hope that the political pressure and the worldwide political situation is such that a renewed nuclear test by one of the 
big actors like Russia or the United States would carry such a public outrage that they dare not just make another test again. It may be legal if they wanted to do that, but I hope that the public outcry uh, that they fear would be so bad they're not going to try. Mic number two and make it quick, please. Uh, quick heads up. Officially, Alabama does not store or produce nuclear weapons. And ah, uh, a question, you. maybe you know, uh, are there any movements against semi-nuclear weapons or weapons that don't actually try to uh, cause a chain reaction but use nuclear shit stored inside them to produce heat in order to explode uh, like tank engines and stuff like that, like the UN uses in Afghanistan? Well, you have... Um You have uh, depleted uranium ammunition, of course, where they use uranium just because it's a very hard yeah. metal. Um, and that causes radiological problems for the population. There is rises in cases of cancer and radiation. No, I meant poison. if they try to conceal if that in any way. Conceal? Like, no. To, to, uh, if there are any movements against these types of ammunition, because they also leave fallout. Well, there is the idea of a fissile material cutoff treaty. That would mean that all the nuclear uh, weapons capable material like uranium and plutonium in the world have to be controlled, and you have to really write down how much you have and where it is and have safeguards in place. Um, so I guess that would encompass uh, this type of material so that it couldn't get into the wrong hands and be made into weapons. So let's hope also, beside the CTBT being ratified, that the fissile material cut-off treaty can really happen. Okay, we are out of time. Please, once again, thank Michael.